So welcome everyone to the final event in the CELS Winter Speaker Series, Technoscience Beyond the Nation State. I'm Matthew Sample, Professor of Responsible Research and Innovation at Leibniz University, Hanover. I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Anna Wynn at the Faculty of Humanities, who will be moderator for the Q&A later. If you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A, please send it to Anna using the chat function, and she'll either call on you or synthesize the questions into one. We also have Norma at GRT Captioning will be providing live captioning. You can turn on live captions using the CC button in Zoom or by visiting the link. Um, Irina will put that in the chat. So I just wanted to say a few words about the theme of the series. Science and knowledge and technology, both historically and today, are deeply entangled with nationalist projects aiding in the consolidation of power and also providing the means for acts of violence. So our hope over the series is we can tackle both of the meanings implied by beyond the nation state. That is, we not only want to critique particular combinations of techno science and nationalism, we also want to try to advance new ways to act and live together across borders and develop international solidarity. So there's both a critical and a constructive project we're trying to participate in. So today we're so fortunate to be joined by Dr. Samana Roy. She's the author of How I Became a Tree, a work of nonfiction, Missing, a novel, My Mother's Lover, and other stories, and then two poetry collections, uh, Out of Syllabus, and then a VIP, Very Important Plant. Mm -hmm. I love the title. She's currently Associate Professor of English and Creative Writing at Ashoka University. Thank you so much for joining us, Samana. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Matthew, and uh, hi, Anna. I, I didn't realize you were here. Uh, we've kind of communicated on Twitter, uh, etc. Um, hello to everyone who's joined in from wherever you have. I am in, I'm speaking from um, Shiliguri, a small town in Bengal, which is where I've spent most of my life. Um, <clears throat> I have a slight cold, so I'm sorry for this. A couple of months ago, as I was preparing to apply for the Schengen visa that would allow me to make a visit to Germany next summer, I wrote to Matthew, Professor Matthew Sample, the organizer of this series of lectures, to help me with a letter that would expedite the visa process. Matthew was quick, very quick, like a gardener who waters a drooping plant urgently, responded with great immediacy. Soon after the nervous energy of those first few moments had subsided, my thoughts went, as they always do, to the other residents at home. <coughs> I'm sorry. My father-in-law would have a caregiver to support him, but the plants, the more than 200 plants and trees that live with us, a wayward thought. What if it were possible by some magical transportation device to carry them with me? like animals were carried with their human families. If such a thing were to be made magically possible, would I need to ask Matthew for help to get them visas as well? P for plant and P for passport. Both the words begin with P and end with T, and yet they couldn't be more different from each other. I say this as if I know this about plants. See how I've put it in the title of my talk, Plants Against Passports. How am I presuming this? Is there a history of such presumption? Presumption, though, is part of the apparatus that nurtures our understanding of the natural world, one that we then intuitively amplify into what, from the need to articulate this into language, we eventually end up calling politics and aesthetics. That is how it begins for most of us. And that is how it used to began for me, with my grandmother. My grandmother, a small but fussy eater, refugee dislocated by partition, refused to let certain flowers enter her thakul ghar, her prayer room, where she pampered her gods and goddesses with food, incense sticks, miniature gold jewelry, and of course, flowers and leaves. When my cousins and I went plucking flowers for her worship in the morning, she picked the white flowers at first, Shuli and Tagore and many others, then the red hibiscus for her goddess Kali, Tulsi leaves to purify everything, leaves from the mango and wood apple tree, 
thin grass stalks that we call dubbogharsh, all of which were necessary for her worship. But she ignored the rows of flowers that my grandfather so painstakingly got planted in the front courtyard. The roses, they were not for her gods. They were bideshi, foreign. Though we never asked her why she thought so, we discovered this soon through family gossip from my aunt. My grandmother, who had never really traveled beyond her place of birth and then of dislocation to India, and who, who had never been to school, had decided from village lore that roses had come to India with the Mughals. That made it a foreign flower for her gods. Now, Bangla names for plant life are often marked by the journey the plants made to reach Bengal. The word for chilies in Bangla, for instance, is Lanka, Lanka. Sri Lanka was the port from where chilies from the New World were supposed to have entered Bengal, hence the name. Chine Badam, the groundnut that is supposed to have arrived in these parts through China and so on. So it was against the slightly confusing background of both an affiliation and disaffiliation to ideas of foreignness in the plant world that I came to think about plants and passports. Inquisitive about the percolation of philosophies that might have annotated a collective conscious, such as my grandmother's, I began looking for an intellectual ancestry. My grandmother's name was Anna Purna. Anna, or Onno as we say in Bangla, is grain, purna, fullness. In the name is a history of hope and reliance on a paddy harvest for a rice-eating population such as ours. Many decades later, when the public distribution system of the Indian nation state for food would reach their village, my grandmother refused to stand in queues for the weekly provision of rice grains that was due to her family. No, it wasn't her ego or exhaustion. It was fear, plain fear. She could not eat anything that she was not familiar with. Such was biological conditioning once. Not having had the opportunity to go to school, she had no English. One word though she knew. When she saw the rice in other people's hands, she turned to that English word cold in it, all the disgust that she had felt for what the British had damaged and what had been given to her. She called it passport chal, passport rice. She called this rice from the ration system. As I grew older, she left us a few days after I turned eight, 19. I began to see that it wasn't the everyday working ethics that derived from the plant world. Evident in the idiomatic return to flowers and leaves and roots and, uh, repeatedly, but that their ideas of the nation state had also been annotated by it. It is a subject that hasn't been remarked upon, how the proximity and understanding of a natural world produced a political understanding in the Indian subcontinent. She wasn't alone. There was Rabindranath Tagore, who many of you might know as the first Asian to be awarded the Nobel Prize, who was alive when my grandmother was born. Rabindranath Tagore's understanding of his own culture and indeed of his own consciousness was mediated through a belief in the Indian subcontinent as being, quote, a vast land of forests or even a large forest. I'm quoting from his book, Shadhuna. When the first Aryan invaders appeared in India, it was a vast land of forests and the newcomers rapidly took advantage of them. These forests afforded them shelter from the fierce heat of the sun and the ravages of tropical storms, pastures for cattle, fuel for sacrificial fire, and materials for building cottages. And the different Aryan clans with their patriarchal heads settled in the different forest tracts, which had some special advantage of natural protect, uh, protection and food and water in plenty. Thus in India, it was in the forest that our civilization had its birth, and it took a distinct character from this origin and environment. This, as I said, is from his book, Shadhuna or Sadhana. What does it imply when one sees an entire civilization as having originated in a forest? What makes it different from a civilization that, for instance, is biblically said to have found its birth in a garden? 
as the civilizational culture of Rabindranath's colonizer had. He sits this against Europe, which he says is a sea which, quote, seemed to be at constant war with the land and its children, and which he fought and won, the spirit of fight continued in him. This is about the European man. Now, India's culture of leisure, of rest, of optimism, of a natural cosmopolitanism that comes from the accommodativeness of the forest where there is room for everyone, where no one is rejected, and of Ananda, a spirit that Rabindranath understands as genetic to this place and its people, is a gift of forest living. I quote again from Rabindranath. In the level tracts of Northern India, men found no barrier, this is important, no barrier between their lives and the grand life that permeates the universe. The forest entered into a close relationship with their work and leisure, with their daily necessities and contemplations. They could not think of other surroundings as separate or inimical. So the view of the truth with each, which these men found did not make manifest the difference but rather the unity of all things. And then he quotes from the Upanishads, a Sanskrit quote, which means all that is vibrates with all that is vibrates with life having come out from life. Unquote. This, if we notice carefully, is a challenge to the European post-Renaissance anthropocentric understanding of life. Man is not at the center. He is like all other forms of the living only a manifestation of life. He is merely one of many, none of whom are rejected by the structure of the forest and by metaphorical implication by the political state. We are given a model of monarchy where the king must find their way through a forest. Rabindranath chooses to read the epic Ramayana as the human's relationship with the forest, with nature, one of in interest and curiosity and coexistence. I quote him again, in the Ramayana, Rama and his companions in their banishment had to traverse forest after forest. They had to live in leaf thatched huts to sleep on the bare ground. But as their hearts felt their kinship with woodland, hill and stream, they were not in exile amidst these. Poets brought up in an atmosphere of different ideals would have taken this opportunity of depicting in dismal colors the hardship of the forest life in order to bring out the martyrdom of Ramchandra, which is the king, with all the emphasis of a strong co contrast. But in the Ramayana, we are led to realize the greatness of the hero, not in a fierce struggle with nature, but in sympathy with it. Sita, the daughter-in-law of a great kingly house, goes along the forest paths, asking about names, of the different uh, forms of plant life, unquote. The worship of Ram, the hero, and his heroism that has driven the Indian nation state in the last few decades, particularly since the 1990s, the overwhelming human-centeredness in reading the epic is rejected by Rabindranath for this model of forest living that gives dignity to all its residents. Only such a life, he says, will bring Sachidananda, pure consciousness, pure bliss, says the poet. India's pilgrimage sites, he notices, are in the forested hills. And he says, man is not free, not to look upon nature as a source of supply of his necessities, but to realize the soul beyond himself, unquote. This is Rabindranath's plant philosophy. And that is how he imagined India, imagined India not the nation state, not the garden where man is king and controller, but the forest and its natural cosmopolitanism. And it was this that he would try to create in Shantiniketan, in the gardens of Uttaraya, with his son Rothindranath, carrying seeds, grafts and saplings from his travels to give them a home irrespective of their nationality. And also again in Sriniketan. Now, around the time my grandmother was born, Vidhubhushan Bandhupadhyay was in the forests of Bihar, a college graduate without a job or parental and financial support. Vidhubhushan had to leave Calcutta for Bihar to become an assistant manager in an agricultural estate. Diary records of his time there 
of clearing the forest to make way for an agricultural estate for his employer would become his novel Arunno. As Rimli Bhattacharya, the translator of Arunnak notes, and I quote her, destruction of the forest is a necessary prelude to the Adi Parva of the Mahabharata. Khandavavana is consumed by fire to provide a clearing for Indraprastha, whose urban magnificence is only the site of further dissension. Bhivuti Bhushan, I must say here that Indraprastha would be, you know, the city, the city capital, the city state, as it were, for in the Mahabharata. For Bhivuti Bhushan, the human's residency in the forest would seem natural, coming as it would have from being conditioned to the reasoning of our epics, both the idea of vanvas or exile that Rabindranath was commenting on in the case of the Ramayana and vanaprastha with his retirement, how by going to the forest, you retire from, worldly from the worldly life by going into the forest. The forest compels Satya, the protagonist of Aranya, to question the idea of who or what constitutes the category of the civilized. And he says, Satya says, at one place in the novel, it seemed to me that people in Bengal had become much too civilized in comparison, unquote. And so Calcutta, the only city Satya, the protagonist of the novel has seen, becomes an approximation of a nation state. Both Rabindranath and Vibhuti Bhushan, forgive me, in Bengal, we refer to our writers and artists by their first names, not necessarily their surnames. Um, so both Rabindranath and Vibhuti Bhushan are turning to the forest as a political model. Though I say political, it includes much more. A thought system that compels the human to see connectedness over individual benefit. In Aranya, in Aranya though, uh, through Satya, <coughs> sorry, the protagonist whose name means truth, Satya means truth, and it's a common name in India. We are given a sense of history of the kind that does not come to us through textbooks. And this is a quote from the novel. The narrator, Satya, says, the forests and hills had been thus for many centuries. So must this forest have been when the Aryans had crossed the Khaibar long ago and had entered the land of the five rivers, when Buddha had silently left his home at night. On that night long ago, the mountain peaks must have laughed as they do on this moonlit night. And so it was when the poet Valmiki, immersed in composing his epic Ramayana in his hut by the Tamasa River, must have started to find out, find that the day was gone. Who had inhabited this forest in those distant times? Not too far away from the jungle, I had seen an old woman who could have been anything between 80 to 90 years old the absolute embodiment of the poem Bharat Chandra's rendering of Ma Annapurna as an ancient woman. Now, I suddenly remembered the old woman. She was a symbol of the civilization of the forest, unquote. I think of my grandmother, another Annapurna, as I always, whenever I read these passages. In paragraphs that follow this one, Satya criticizes the idea of progress the Parthenon, the Taj Mahal, the Cologne Cathedral, the aeroplane, ship, railway, wireless, electricity, all of these, while, again, I quote him, the na natives of Papua New Guinea and the ancient aborigines of Australia and the Mundas, Poles, Nagas, and Kukis of India have not moved on in these 5,000 years, unquote. Satya is induced, induced in fact, inspired to start planting seeds of wildflowers and plants in the forest, even as he has to get parts of it cleared for creating the agricultural estate. This doubleness seems ingrained in the character of the forest cosmopolitanism, so that there can be an ashram, ashram uh, for those of you, I think most of you are familiar with the word, it means um, a spiritual retreat, but basically a shram, a place where there is no labor, but labor is of a different kind of spiritual labor, a, a, a retreat. So not only ashram, but forests also have their own kings and their own political system. A quote from the novel. The leader of the Santal revolt is still alive. 
is the present Raja. Raja is king. His name is Dobru Panna Birbardi. He's very old and very poor. But all the indigenous people of the land give him the respect due to a king. He's still regarded as a king, although he doesn't have a kingdom anymore, unquote. It seems like an oxymoron in, in our world. And of course, in Bibhuti Bhushan's, when George V was ruling over the British Empire, that kings could be poor at all. Raja Dobrupanna's wealth is his natural nobility and the riches of his memory, of his valor. He says, these forests and the hills, all the earth was once our kingdom. I have fought against the company, he means the East India Company, of course, when I was young. Now I'm many years old. It's, it's, I find it very moving, many years old. Two systems of counting and uncountability. We lost our battle. Now there is nothing left, unquote. That they and their politics derives from the forest itself is emphasized in many ways. The king's grandson is said to have a body like the young sal tree, muscular and supple. And he says that farmland is for farming, it's forbidden to our race. The first page of Bhivuti Bhushan Bandhupadha's novel, Itta Moti, where we see the terrible effects of the Permanent Settlement Act of 1793, begins with a revolutionary, still, I would still call it revolutionary a hundred years later, begins with a revolutionary formulation of history. Both history and its Bangla equivalent, Itihas, are etymologically derived from a shared investment in the human story or narrative of a person's life from asti, meaning he is. Bhivuti Bhushan changes both the subject and the frame. I quote, this is the first, this is the first few sentences from the novel Ichamati, which is the name of a river. Take a boat from Morighata or Bajitpur right up to Chanduria Ghat, and you shall see the bright red flowers of the Polte and Mada trees on either bank. The aquatic, aquatic foliage of the bone buro, the radiance of the yellow flowers of the wild titpalla creeper, and the floating leaves of topapana. Sometimes along a high bank, you will spy shrubs of uluti bachra and boinchi in the shadow of ancient companion and people trees, the nesting holes of river mayanas, and everywhere the pleasing spread of creepers and all manner of greens. On occasion, you might cite a vulture sitting atop one of the crisscross branches of a tall silk cotton tree in a stillness suggesting a higher state of spiritual realization, like a wash painting done by a Chinese artist. When the moonlight falls on the green grassy fields that have sprung up on the sandbanks, where white clusters of akundo flowers blossom in the, spring, in the summer, and the mild breeze from the river sways the golden laburnum along the banks. And he continues, you know, these descriptions of a plant life. He says, as you pass by these ruins of homes, you will dream of bygone days, of a mother and her son, of a brother and a sister, whose lives were once entwined with these living signs of habitation. From one century to another, many other unwritten histories of joy and sorrow that lie on their breasts, like the tracery of lines of water in the rains. And this, this, this is what makes it revolutionary for me. This is what he says. Their voices, their stories are the real history of our nation. Real history of our nation. What is that? The history of plant life, records of its settlement on land as well as its death, an evacuation from these spaces, a census of plants and trees, all these constitute our national history, not only the life of kings, queens, and the famous. Bhivuti Bhushan is writing this in a novel published in 1950. The year India becomes a republic and gives to itself its constitution, and decades before the formation of the subaltern collective. 75 years later, these words read like a preamble to an imagined India of what might have been had this understanding of national history and the nation state been institutionalized. 
freedom, Vibhuti Bhushan sees in the middle of India's anti-colonial struggle in the 1930s, not just as something given to its citizens by the nation state, but as something that is a condition of the living of life. Freedom, as all of you know, comes from the same root as friend, meaning someone or something that is dear. When I think of those I feel closest to, those I love, I notice only one thing common among them, that they make me feel free. It is possible that it is my conditioning in this understanding of freedom that makes me gravitate so urgently towards what Vibhuti Bhushan's plant life gives him and the characters in his novels. Idiomatic usage, <coughs> anthropomorphic as it is, connects freedom to birds, linking quite obviously the freedom imagined in flight. The supposed lack of obstructions to movement in the sky, that experience of freedom. Plants and trees, on the other hand, are stuck to the earth, unable to move. To be able to imagine them as free is also quite revolutionary. This understanding of freedom, one that is possible to access even when the movement is limited, comes from science as much as it does from the Upanishads. I'm thinking of very two very similar sounding words, plant and plan planet. All planetary bodies, including the earth, from where and from which we seek freedom, in their place because of various forces, are free, if only we can imagine them as such. This is what Bhibhuti Bhushan says in Pothir Pachali, his novel about Oku, um, that Satyajit Ray turned into a film. Uh, here he's writing about two children, Opu and his sister, older sister, Durga, who are moving through the fields, uh, through the forest. The joy of pure freedom, never before tasted, had made their young blood sing. They had been in no state to stop and ask for directions in no state to stop and consider the consequences of running wildly into the unknown. The sister had realized that she had lost her way. In their glorious run for freedom through the fields, they had seen no villages to, mark this phrase, mark the way. They had seen no villages to mark the way. That is, there were no divisions, only paddy fields, marshland, and thickets of cane. This is from the novel Pothir Pachami. Now, the absence of borders, of things that mark divisions, of no villages, of the lack of humans and their habitats on the way is what enables this sense of freedom. So English writers come to mind. John Clare, whose poems and poetic temperament would be deeply affected by the division of land into enclosures, the taming of land, its forest and agrarian spaces into rectangles, but that would affect the sense of freedom and the structure of his verses. And D.H. Lawrence, who wanted to imagine a space that had not been touched by the human. The freedom that Opu and Durga experience, the children in the novel Patri Pachali, the freedom that they experience is the freedom both to the eye and to the limbs. The eyes meet no obstructions. The species of plants changes, but change, sorry, but the visual freedom is that of looking at the sky, only this time experienced to the body as one imagines birds doing in the sky. It is also the freedom of the unknown, of being unshackled from certainty. To see the impress of the human hand and the human mind is always to feel like a dog on a leash. The reason, for instance, we always feel like an employee nowadays, aware of the control of the human world on us all the time even through our uh, social media notifications say. Hence the Bengali modernist obsession and celebration of the new dawn, the new. And Bhibhuti Bhushan says, at such times, you should feel no less than the famous explorers who charted new land. When I visit one, I discover it with my mind, my heart, and with all of my senses. I taste of its newness and I'm elated. I'll repeat that first sentence you should feel no less than the famous explorers who charted new lands. You therefore have a model against passports there as well. Freedom is looseness, looseness that gives grace, 
the reason even swaying coconut trees and falling flowers look beautiful to the human eye. This model of freedom that Vibhuti Bhushan desires comes from the plant world, and it is one that he seeks from the political system. That is why he shows the damage caused by European colonialism in several ways. He calls a few tree, trees English trees all through the novel Ichamoti, thereby reminding his readers of how the landscape was being changed by colonial botanists. There is, of course, the indigo plantation post on certain areas of Bengal by the British. The cruelty both on humans and plants causing impoverishment of both men and soil. Following this is abandonment without compunction. Land and life, both plant and human, exist only for commerce in this world. It is, however, not just the plantation or scene that is being brought to our attention to be criticized. The introduction of quote-unquote foreign trees, seeds and bulbs and cuttings brought by European botanists to Bengal, to Calcutta, its neighboring towns and villages, and to sanatorium towns began changing the character of plant vegetation as well as the quality of soil. Richard Axel B, just to cite one example in his essay, the Calcutta, um, Calcutta Botanical Gardens and the Colonial Reordering of Indian Environment, explains how the botanical garden near Calcutta was changed to accommodate and then give hierarchical importance to migrant plant life. It isn't so much the introduction of new species that troubles Vibhuti Bhushan as the reordering of the natural world and human maneuvering and control over it. It is not only the Indian who finds something in this freedom. The Englishman Colesworthy Grant in the novel, who's not only a painter, but a poet and writer as well, have, had found something in this Bengal. I quote, rural Bengal had opened up new vistas before his eyes. Dazzling laburnum trees dotting an unbroken suite of fields, the clamor of unknown birds from the flowering bushes, shrubs, and trees. Unquote. How did the Europeans colonize the land? And Bhutan says, luxuriant gardens had once been planted on either side. Huge trees, English trees that Robson Shahib had planted, all of which now made the graveyard heavy with darkness. Who gave a hoot for it now? There's also an unquote, there's also another spotless and shining, a phrase used for the English idea of beauty is never used for the landscape and its plant life anywhere else. That phrase spotless and shining is almost an indictment, though it is seemingly used to speak of a more favorable time for the colonizer. Vibhuti Bhushan uses the word Bharat Varsha to mean more than India more than geographical territory, and more than what a concept such as a nation can hold. In Ichamati, for instance, the word is inaugurated by the scent of fragrant flowers and the green spreading fields of autumn valley. And this is a quote from the novel. This is India, Bharat Varsha, Holdsworthy Grant mused. He had been wandering all over the country. The India that he had glimpsed through Monier Williams's translation of Shakuntalam and in the poetry of Edwin Arnold, for which he had come so far. Now at last, in all his sojourn, he had a sense of a different world, exquisitely beautiful, resonant with poetry, on the banks of a river in this obscure little village in the fading afternoon light. He felt it had been worth all his traveling. And in India imagined through literature a map and a Bharat Varsha encountered through experience. Whether the village or the forest in Aranya, where one of the forest dwellers asks about the location of Bharat Varsha. Have you heard the name Bharat Varsha? Bhanmati, one of the forest dwellers, indicated by shaking her head that she had not heard of it. She had never traveled beyond Chakmakitola. In which direction was Bharat Varsha? Imagine an Indian asking that question, where is India? In which direction is India? It seems that Bibhuti Bhushan is hinting towards the sense of the land being not in its cities. Only in these forest spaces can one feel, again, to quote him, the nurturing spirit of the earth, goddess Jagadhatri herself. 
Now, uh, the resistance and disobedience or civil disobedience movements against the British by Indians, by our political thinkers have been studied. It might be fruitful. <laughs> Believe me, that choice of idiom wasn't deliberate. Uh, but I really think it might be fruitful to think of the many writers and artists who turn to the plant world unconsciously for models outside the hand-me-down European political models such as the nation state. I could speak only about Rabindranath and Vibhuti Bhushan with you today, to you today. But there was Qazi Nazrul Islam, who for instance responded to strained Hindu-Muslim relations and consequent riots with a song such as Mora Aki Brinte Duti Kushum Hindu Musulman. We are two buds on the same branch or, same, or the same stem, Hindu and Muslim. There is also Shukumar Ray, arguably Bengal's finest nonsense poet, who created a poem out of the idea, a metaphor of the Bisho Toru. Bisho is world, Toru, tree, a world tree, an impulse against the narrow confines of the nation state. Going, uh, this, all, this is also a referencing of what Shukumar Ray's friend, Rabindranath Tagore, about whom I just spoke to you, called his university, Bisho Bharati, the world, and Bharati is India. And there was Jibon Anandadash, who tried to imagine a political system in at least two possible ways, by thinking of plants and history, a sense of natural continuity that could exist without human interference. The other was his obsession with grass. In Khash, Khash is the Bangla word for grass, a poem from the Bonolata Shen collection that I'll paraphrase for you right now. Grass is turned into something epical, an aesthetic that was usually reserved for trees. The world is, this is the paraphrase, the world is filled with soft green light of tender lemon leaves, grass like unripe pomelo, of a similar fragrance. The deer are tearing it with their teeth. I too feel the desire to drink the fragrance of this grass in glassfuls like green wine. I mix and croak this grass's body. I rub it on my eyes. The wings of grass are my feathers. I am born as grass inside grass, dropping from a dense grass mother's dark, delicious body. It is quite evident that grass is not just grass for him. It is metaphor, sure. It is the poetic, sure, but it is also his politics. A natural analogy of the human, the humanitas, the humus to humility, all related to the soil where the grass is. It is that smell that he seeks, as if by becoming grass, he can find secrets of soil and depth that the human body with its vertical life has made him forget. Shuranjana, today your heart is grass. This is a line from a poem. What does it mean to have a heart of grass? It is as if life, this world, this world of space and of time, time that the poet tried to stop and understand was composed of grass. Grass, fields of grass, without beginning and end, as infinite as the human heart. It is as if Jivaranando was proposing the rhizome much before Deleuze and Guattari. He seeks to return to this life, to this world, uh, over and over again, not as human, neither as tree, but as grass. Speaking about all these people a hundred years after they wrote and 30 years after my grandmother left us and 75 years after Indian independence, I can only say that I wish that the Indian nation state had followed their thoughts of a country modeled on political systems that had the ethics of the forest and grass. Alas, thank you.